everybody. Um, so welcome to today's talk. Uh, so Nicolas Sermpilatze is a postdoctoral researcher at the Functional Imaging Lab of the German Primate Center in Göttingen, Germany. His research focuses on the effect of anesthesia on brain function, a topic that he explores with neuroimaging technique, including functional magnetic resonance imaging and in vivo two photon calcium imaging. He collects and analyzes data from multiple mammalian species, including humans, various, various non-human primates and rats. He's particularly interested in the neural activity patterns that arrive across various steps of anesthesia, either spontaneously or in reaction to sensory stimulation. He's a strong proponent of open and collaborative science. In his free time, he enjoys dancing to swing music and playing the saxophone. Um, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Nadia, for the introduction. And thanks uh, uh, to the Douglas Research Center for inviting me to this uh, seminar. Uh, as I was telling Malar earlier, this is my first uh, official invited talk. So uh, thanks for the honor and I'm glad to be here with you. So let me share my screen. That should, you should see the screen now. Okay. Uh, so the topic I will be talking about today uh, is uh, called fMRI signatures of deep anesthesia in primates and rodents. Uh, this talk is based on a recent preprint, uh, which uh, was uh, I uploaded a few weeks ago, and I will also link to that at the end of the talk, where you can learn more details about this work. Uh, as Nadia said, I'm a postdoc uh, in the Functional Imaging Lab at the German Primate Center, uh, but I just recently um, submitted my PhD there, so uh most of this work is based on the main project i had uh, during my phd uh, so first of all when we talk about anesthesia uh, why are we interested in anesthesia or why am i interested personally um, well this painting is from the mid 19th century as you can see and it's the documentation of the first official uh, demonstration of anesthesia uh, in a public venue and you can see here a dentist uh, named William Morton, and he's holding a glass uh, tube, and inside it there is a sponge which is drenched in ether. So it's an inhalable gas anesthetic. So as you can see, uh, this moment was quite long ago, nearly two centuries now, and it has utterly transformed the face of medicine and also veterinary medicine, because almost every invasive procedure would be impossible uh, without the use of anesthesia or we or would be completely inhumane and brutal, as was the case uh, before this painting uh, was made. Uh, and the importance of that discovery cannot be uh, uh, overstated because right now, as I'm talking, thousands of people around the world undergo uh, invasive procedures and most of them do so without any complications. Uh, and this is quite an astonishing fact, if you think about it, because Despite the time we've had since 1846, uh, I will argue that we don't really understand how anesthetics work. Uh, so we know some details here and there, but overall we have no overarching working theory to explain why all these different drugs produce the effect we describe as anesthesia. And uh, I think anesthetics are difficult to understand because of uh, their diversity. First of all, diversity in species, because anesthetics work on anything from worms to human beings. Uh, but also diversity in structures, because if you look at the molecular structures of the most commonly used uh, anesthetic drugs, you will find in there simple gases like nitrous oxide or even xenon, a noble gas, which makes no biological sense, uh, up to very complex molecules like uh, theopental and barbiturates and so on. And if you now search for the molecular targets of these drugs in the brain, you will find a, a vast array of receptors uh, like neurotransmitter receptors, ion channels and so on. So with all this diversity, it's very hard to pin on anesthesia on a specific pathway in the brain, whether it's molecular pathway or some circuit. Um, however, if anesthesia phenomenologically looks so similar to us, there has to be some convergence somewhere in the brain in the end, right? On a functional level. And this convergence we we do typically observe on something like EEG, where we, if we look at EEG patterns during anesthesia, we will see some common features. And here I will show the example of isoflurane anesthesia, which is one of the most commonly used anesthetics uh, uh, in research, for example, for animals. 
but it's very similar to anesthetics that are used uh, every day in humans like semaflurane, desflurane, and so on. And it's an inhalable gas. And by tweaking the concentration of the gas, you can fine tune the depth of anesthesia from very light to very deep. And uh, when you have light to moderate anesthesia, on the EEG, you will see high amplitude, low frequency waves, the so-called slow waves, which are uh, very similar to what you typically see during non-REM sleep. Uh, but if you go deeper into anesthesia, this continuous uh, pattern of slow waves will be interrupted by gaps of silence, which we call suppressions. And this uh, quasi-periodic alternation between bursts of activity and gaps of silence is called burst suppression. As we increase the anesthesia dose and we go deeper and deeper into anesthesia, these uh, gaps or suppressions tend to become longer in duration and the bursts become shorter. And eventually you reach a point where you can observe no activity on the EEG. So you have an isoelectric line, which normally you would um, take as brain death, but this is the reversible. So if you go lower with the anesthetic dose, you will traverse these stages in reverse until you end up with slow waves and also eventually you're awake. Now this, I'm very particularly interested in this uh, green pattern here, the burst suppression pattern, because it has the very interesting phenomenology of the brain seemingly turning on and off in a bistable way and seems to oscillate between these two states of being silent and, and being active. Uh, and uh, interestingly, this activity we don't only find in isoflurane, we also find it uh, with many other anesthetics like semaflurane, propofol, barbiturates, etomidat. And interestingly, you also find it in many coma patients. So some people with coma, either due to hypoxia or deep hypothermia, or some children with metabolic encephalopathies, also display this burst suppression activity on their EEG. So we could say that burst suppression is some kind of functional attractor, so a common pathway in the brain where all these different states end up in, including different kinds of anesthesias. For this reason, uh, I, I wanted to study uh, this activity. However, the mechanism of this is not known. So it's not known how it arises that we have this bistable situation in the brain. But before we get to the mechanism, uh, it's often uh, advisable to first make a good description of the phenomenon. So build a good descriptive model of birth suppression before we dive into the mechanism. And for the descriptive model, uh, you need, of course, temporal information. Uh, so about when bursts happen. And this you can get easily from the EEG. Uh, so the EEG can give you very precisely uh, the timing of burst and suppression phases. However, as you probably know, its uh, spatial resolution is poor. It doesn't see anything that's below the surface, very deep in the brain. And yeah, so it cannot tell us really where this activity is happening in the brain. To answer the where question, we can use something like fMRI, a bold fMRI in my case which has the high spatial resolution and the whole brain coverage to answer the where question. However, fMRI has a very famous uh, drawback. Uh, the drawback is that it does not measure neural activity directly. Instead, it measures a proxy metric, which is the oxygenation of the blood, uh, basically. And this blood oxygenation follows neural activity. Uh, it's correlated with it, but it follows it with some delay. And the relationship between the neural activity and the blood oxygenation signal is kind of convoluted, where we have many steps in the process called neurovascular coupling. However, it's, this process is usually summarized in the form of a function, which is the hemodynamic re response function, or HRF for short. And what you can do with the HRF is that you can take it and convolve it with any arbitrary stimulus train or task train, and the result will be the model of your fMRI signal. So how you would expect the fMRI signal to behave in response to that kind of stimulus or task. So now we can take this concept, which is the most basic concept of analyzing fMRI data, and apply it to our birth suppression situation. Because if you think about it, uh, here is a spectrogram of a patient during birth suppression, and you can see uh, this burst and suppression phases on EG. We can think of bursts as task uh, tasks and suppressions as rests. So we can model this phenomenon like we model the, the most basic uh, block design fMRI experiment. Uh, 
And if we do this, we basically get a boxcar function uh, describing the birth suppression. And if we convolve this with HRF, we get a model, uh, an each derived model, which predicts uh, how our fMRI signal should be in response to birth suppression. Now, if at the same time with the EEG, we simultaneously acquire fMRI, uh, we can uh, map, we can basically connect these two by using the EEG derived model as a regressor in a classical GLM analysis, which will give us a map, uh, which will be in the end a map of birth suppression. So it will show us which areas of the brain are significantly correlated with this predicted pattern. Now, this was not my idea. This was already done uh, at the time around where I was beginning my PhD. Uh, this was done by some researchers in, in Munich. Uh, and what these researchers did is that they took 20 human uh, volunteers, males, and they anesthetized them with self rain at three different doses. So the high, intermediate, and low dose. And the highest dose, uh, they, they knew from the literature that it would lead to probably to first suppression. There, then during all three doses, they acquired uh, about 11 minutes of simultaneously simultaneous EEG and fMRI. And they followed the analysis I just described to get a map of birth suppression. And this is one of the, uh, this is from a figure from that paper in 2017. And they saw that uh, most of the cortex uh, and also the striatum, the basal ganglia here, was positively correlated uh, with the birth suppression. However, there was an important exception, and this exception was the visual cortex, which you can see here at the occipital lobe, which in some patients was not correlated at all with this activity, and in some other patients, like here, it was anticorrelated. This was quite perplexing because birth suppression before that was assumed to be uniform, was assumed to be same and synchronous everywhere in the brain. So this kind of hints that this is not the case. When I read this paper, I was quite intrigued. <clears throat> And since uh, <clears throat> in the lab I work in, we are doing mainly MRI in animals, I, want, I, I wondered whether I could reproduce uh, this result in animal models. And why is that uh, useful? Uh, first of all, in animals, we can use a, a much wider array of tools. We, we do not limit ourselves to fMRI. So we can combine fMRI uh, uh, with a host of other invasive tools. Um, also tools for causally interfering with activity. So in the future, animals gives us, gives us, uh, give us a lot of possibilities to explore a scientific question and to really dive into its causes. However, before we start doing that, we first need to reproduce this result in animals. And we would basically need to map our suppression on the brains of mouse, rat, monkey, and so on, or whatever species we are interested in. One way to do that would be to basically replicate the human study exactly and to acquire simultaneous EEG uh, fMRI in the species that we are interested in. So basically the, the, the forward approach of going from EEG to fMRI. However, if you've ever attempted to do that, uh, you, I'm sure you will know that it's a very challenging task. So doing EEG in a high magnetic field, which is especially high for animal scanners, is quite the challenge. There are some, con uh, some commercial systems available for human use and also very few for animals, but they are very expensive and technically very hard to pull off. So at that point, I thought, wait a minute, do we actually need the EEG in the first place? Maybe there is a way to look at the fMRI data during anesthesia and identify birth suppression directly. So what I wanted to, do, to find was some kind of uh, fMRI signature of birth suppression that would allow me to recognize when this state is present. And to find the signature, I went back uh, to that Munich data I talked about. So I, I Skyped with uh, the authors of the study. I, I told them my intentions, and they were quite kind to, to send me the data uh, and to collaborate uh, on this project. And I was quite happy to get that data because this data contains two kinds of scans. So most of the scans which are uh, acquired during the high dose are in birth suppression. But we also have scans from lower concentrations in which we do not have suppressions. We just have this continuous slow wave activity. And uh, because we have the AEG, we have the ground truth. So we know which scans are in birth suppression and we know which ones are in continuous activity. So to answer my fMRI signature question, 
I only need to come up with a way to use the fMRI of, of, from those subjects to differentiate between these two states. So I, I, I started on, on working on this, and uh, the first thing I did was visualize the data. I'm a big fan of data visualization, and I will show you an example here. So what I've done here is taken the fMRI data of one human subject, uh, anesthetized with self rain at 4.5% during birth suppression, and I've normalized the bolt signal uh, to unit to zero mean and unit variance, basically. And I've overlaid this data on the cortical surface, which is this is the FS average surface. And as I play the video now, you will see uh, the active the fMRI activity playing over time on the cortical surface. At the same time, you will see the EEG going through burst and suppression phases. As I hope uh, you can appreciate, every time there is a burst happening on the EEG, simultaneously there is a very widespread global signal increase that's all over or seems to be all over the cortex. So we can now look at this phenomenon in a, in a different way. We can take this four-dimensional video basically and transform it into two dimensions, it, into something that I call that is called the carpet plot. So carpet plot is another way to visualize fMRI data where you stack all the voxels as rows of a matrix and all the columns of the matrix are time points. So you basically have a 2D representation of your signal. And if you look at the carpet plot of this particular example, you will see this global signal fluctuation that's very easy to see with your eyes. What I did next was uh, apply principal component analysis to this matrix to extract uh, the most dominant, uh, in this case, the five most dominant uh, temporal patterns present in the data. And you can see that the first of those, so principal component one or PC1 for short, is basically capturing uh, what you're seeing here as this global fluctuation. Now, if you take each of these components and you correlate it with this matrix, uh, you will see that the first component is positively correlated with most cortical voxels, while all other components have correlations basically close to zero. And another way to see the same thing is to take the histogram of correlation coefficients, and you see that the components two to five basically have very symmetric Gaussian histograms centered around zero, while the first component is highly skewed to the right and has this very asymmetric histogram. Uh, due to this property, I call such components hereafter, uh, I will call them asymmetric principal components. And the measure of asymmetry is simply the median uh, of this distribution. So if the median is very high, it means that this distribution is highly skewed to positive values. If it's close to zero, it means it looks like these components. And if you look at the, the same subject at a lower level of anesthesia where uh, no suppressions are present, you will see that this global fluctuation is not present, of course, and all components are symmetric. So you can kind of use this the presence of an asymmetric principal component as a marker uh, for the presence of pressure suppression. And this is not true just in this example, it's true across the data set. So here I have visualized the results across uh, the entire data set, where the rows represent different subjects of the study, and the th three subplots show the three concentrations, so high, intermediate, and low. And in pink, I've highlighted the scans in which we have EEG confirmation of birth suppression uh, on the spectrogram. And uh, in green, I show asymmetric principal components. As I hope you can appreciate, every time there is birth suppression on EEG, there is also an asymmetric principal component with a high, very high median uh, value of correlation. There is only one exception to this rule, which is uh, subject number 15 uh, during the high dose, which had birth suppression on the EEG, but had no asymmetric principal component. But if you look at the EEG of this subject, uh, you will see that uh, it had only one very brief burst. So most of the time, this subject was in suppression, so it was almost in the, in the next phase, so in the isoelectric stage of anesthesia. But uh, this plot shows that basically asymmetric PCs are a good signature of birth suppression, but they're actually more than a signature, because if you 
look at the time course of this PC and you compare it to the model we derive uh, from the EG using the HRF approach, you can see that they are quite similar. And in fact, if we correlate these two across subjects, you will see a very high correlation for all pairs. Uh, this means that what this PC represents is actually a direct hemodynamic correlate of the EEG pattern of pair suppression. Therefore, instead of using the EEG to derive the model to map pair suppression, we now have a fMRI only approach of mapping pair suppression, which consists of identifying the presence of asymmetric principal components and when they are present, using those components as regressors for our analysis to create the map. And we took this approach and the map we got was basically uh, reproducing the same result they got in Munich. So you see a very high correlation with breast suppression across the cortex and also in the basal ganglia. However, the visual cortex is excluded. In our case, we found no significant correlation with breast suppression in the visual cortex. We went one step further and we projected this map on the cortical surface. And when we did that, we noticed that it was not just the visual cortex that was excluded, uh, which you can see here in the occipital pole, but also some other patches of cortex, like here uh, in the somatosensory cortex or a small patch in the motor cortex, possibly also here on the superior temporal gyrus, which is uh, where auditory cortex is located, and some other areas like the subcalosal cingulate here. So there is a tendency, as you can see, to exclude primary unimodal cortices, while all other cortical areas seem to be uh, correlated with this activity, which is quite a, a strange pattern. Uh, and then we looked deeper into the subcortical structures because that's what fMRI allows you to do. And again, here you see the very high correlations in the basal ganglia. Actually, the highest correlation values were found in the putamen and the chordate. And in terms of thalamus, you see that some parts of the thalamus are correlated, but here the posterior parts of the thalamus, you can also see here, are not correlated. And the hippocampus is also interesting, where most of it, most of the hippocampus seems to be not correlated uh, with breast suppression. And there is another interesting point. You might have noticed uh, as I'm talking that there are some blue areas around the ventricles. So basically we have a kind of anti-correlation along the ventricular borders. And for fMRI researchers, whenever you see a pattern of activation or deactivation along a border of a structure, that always rings a bell that this is suspicious and this is usually motion. So what kind of motion are we talking about here? Well, I looked uh, closer at this and I basically took the raw EPI data from these subjects and I took a line profile from outside of the brain towards the inside, passing through cortex, white matter, ventricle, and so on. And when you look at the time course of this profile, in the cortex, you see the bursts clearly, but at the ventricular border, you see these decreases in signal, which is basically, it's a true anticorrelation. However, the source of the anticorrelation is interesting because as the, the cortex swells with blood simultaneously almost everywhere, the, the volume of the brain increases and this pushes uh, inwards the ventricular border. This means that uh, the white matter, which is dark on EPI images, displaces voxels which are previously filled with high signal CSF. And this causes the anticorrelation you are seeing here at the border which means that as bursts happen in the brain, this kind of have a pumping effect on the ventricles where they push them inwards during bursts and outwards during, uh, um, during suppressions, uh, which is quite an interesting find, although it was nowhere uh, in my goals of the study, but it's a peculiar phenomenon that I think we should be aware of it. Uh, now coming back uh, to the project, I have kind of intermediate summary here to stop and say that basically what I've described so far represents a way of identifying fMRI signatures of pair suppression and using those signatures to create a map of pair suppression without the need for EEG. Now, if we have such a method, what can we use it for? Uh, one potential use is uh, a clinical one, actually, because I mentioned that there are many patients who uh, are in coma and have birth suppression, 
And in theory, although of course this is not done and we haven't validated this yet, uh, yet in clinical populations, you could take this technique and apply it to these patients and you would get basically a list of brain areas which are involved in doing this breast suppression in these patients. Now, what would this tell you? I don't know, because of course this is a new find. So what the implications of that would be for the prognosis or the management of that patient, it remains to be found, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting avenue to explore maybe. Another use is what I will uh, do now, and what was my original purpose, is to apply this method to animal data. Because in animal fMRI, we often use anesthesia anyway. We use anesthesia to, to, to prevent the animal from moving, basically. So we have a lot of data in our lab, in other labs, with uh, animals uh, anesthetized with various anesthetics during fMRI. So the data is already there. So what we can do now is a sort of an inverse translation step. So we, we take the technique we developed in humans and we walk backwards into animals. And in this talk, I will go through macaques, marmosets, and rats. And we, I took three data sets that uh, were acquired in our laboratory in these three species, uh, long-tailed macaques, uh, common marmosets, and rats. And all animals were anesthetized with isoflurane and were intubated through the mouth and mechanically ventilated kind of simulating the conditions you would also have in a human surgery. Uh, and uh, the macaques were imaged at 3 Tesla, and uh, the marmosets and rats at 9.4 Tesla. So this is an example of a scan from a macaque uh, during what looks suspiciously like birth suppression. I think you will agree that you have this very large global signal fluctuation in the cortex, this is captured by the first principal component, which is clearly asymmetric. And you can see that also on this heat map and also on these histograms. And if you look across the macaque data set we analyzed, you will find basically nine such scans from seven different macaques, which show this signature. So this highly asymmetric principal component. Now, if you take these nine components and look at their distribution across the macaque brain, uh, you will find a map which is very similar uh, functionally to the human map. So if you find high correlation in frontal uh, areas and also in the striatum, but clearly the back of the brain, so the visual areas, is excluded. So here you can see that not only visual cortex, uh, the primary visual cortex, V1, but also higher visual areas are clearly not correlated with breast suppression. And this is also true for a big portion of the somatosensory cortex here. The auditory cortex is, however, correlated. Um, and looking now into uh, the subcortex, again, we find high correlation values in the caudate and the pitamen, but the thalamus is mostly not correlated and also, uh, except for some medial and anterior parts, which are correlated. Cerebellum is, uh, most of the cerebellum is not correlated. Hippocampus and amygdala, it's hard to tell, but big chunks of them seem not to be correlated and some parts are. Although here it's um, hard to judge the quality of this data because in, in macaques or in primates, because the structures are quite low in the brain, very deep, uh, the signal to noise ratio tends to deteriorate and you get high distortions. Um, so I'm not 100% sure about the hippocampus, but the cerebellum, uh, thalamus, uh, were mostly not correlated. Uh, perhaps interesting uh, for the result in the visual cortex, the LGN, which is kind of easy to identify in the macaque brain, is clearly not correlated as well. Now coming to marmosets, uh, here again I show an example of a scan with what looks like a birth suppression. You can see here a highly asymmetric principal component. And if you look across the data set, uh, we found eight uh, subjects, so eight marmosets, that had these asymmetric components, uh, eight out of 20. And when we looked at the distribution of these components across the marmoset brain, um, we found the result that was functionally similar to the macaque and human. So here I have to say that we, in this experiment, we did not cover the entire marmoset brain for technical reasons. So the, the very frontal part uh, is missing. Also the very posterior part of the visual cortex is missing. However, we, we cover big parts of the visual cortex because marmosets have such a huge visual cortex. And the parts we do cover are clearly not correlated with this activity. And uh, you can perhaps appreciate it better in higher visual areas, like here, area MT, 
which is kind of an island uh, in a sea of correlation, which is quite interesting. And also the um, big parts of the somatosensory cortex, S1, and also a higher somatosensory area seem to be excluded from this map. Looking into the subcortex, we again find very strong correlations in the striatum. This is consistent across species so far. Uh, thalamus was mostly not correlated, with possible exceptions at its anterior part. Uh, cerebellum also was not correlated, and uh, hippocampus, again, parts of it were and parts of it were not. And again, important for our visual results, LGN, which is also very easy to identify in the marmoset structurally, uh, was clearly not correlated with this uh, birth suppression activity. Finally, uh, I come to rats. And here you see an example where you have an asymmetric principal component correlated with most of the cortex. However, you may notice that this uh, global bursts of activity seem to be much shorter in duration compared to what we had in monkeys and in humans. And I will come again to this point at the end of the talk. Um, but if we take, uh, if we look for such components, we'll find that uh, we'll find those in many cases. And here we had something interesting happening with the dose of anesthesia. So we had half, half of the animals, which are six uh, animals, starting with isoflurane at 2% and later going to 2.5. And the other half started likewise at 2%, but went later at 1.5. And you will notice that almost all cases of breast suppression were found at 2%. And also actually none was found at 2.5. Uh, and this was quite encouraging for us because from the literature we know that 2% isoflurane is exactly where you would expect birth suppression to happen in rats. But when we looked at the map, uh, we realized that this time breast suppression was pancortical. So here I've highlighted the primary motor and sensory areas of the rat. And you see that pretty much, or actually all of them, are part of the birth suppression map. So no exceptions this time. And within the subcortex, uh, we see the thalamus, medial parts of it are correlated, lateral parts are not. Hippocampus, the dorsal parts of it seem to be correlated, but the ventral ones not. Cerebellum seems to be mostly not correlated. And again, the striatum, as was the case in all primates, also here in rats, is very significantly correlated with birth uh, suppression. So summarizing all these maps uh, so far, uh, what we seem to have is kind of a primate rodent difference, because in rodents, we see that the, the map is uh, all over the cortex, while in primates, there is a clear tendency to exclude a primary unimodal cortices, and especially the visual cortex, uh, because if you look at V1, it was consistently not part of the birth suppression map in all three primate species. Uh, this prompted us to look closer at what happens in V1. We are interested to see what, what is V1 doing if it's not doing birth suppression? And uh, to take another area as a comparison, we selected uh, the cingulate cortex simply because the cingulate was correlated with birth suppression in all uh, four species. So on one hand, we have V1, which is uh, missing in primates, but not in rodents. And on the other hand, we have the cingulate, which is present in all four species. And we extracted the all time courses from these two areas. And here in humans, you can see the cingulate does basically birth suppression, while V1 seems to be on the face of it doing nothing. And if you take the amplitude of the bold fluctuations, you see a very dramatic reduction of bold amplitude in V1 compared to the cingulate. So you see kind of a flattening of V1 activity. And it turns out that the exact same thing is true in, in macaques and in marmosets, where the cingulate cortex basically reflects the birth suppression activity but the visual cortex has a very flat looking uh, bold time courses. Now, if you look in rats, uh, both of these areas uh, are highly correlated with each other and they have similar amplitudes. What we did next was take these time courses and use them as seeds to run a seed based correlation analysis. Because here we are interested in to see okay, if the visual cortex is not correlated with birth suppression, Maybe it's correlated with some other cortical areas that are also missing from the map. And when we took uh, the visual cortex as a seed, we basically found nothing. We found that the visual cortex was correlated with only itself and nothing else. 
But when we took the singlet cortex as a seed, of course, we recaptured the birth suppression map. This is another way to recreate it, basically. And if you look at macaques and marmosets, you will see the same result. The cingulate seed recaptures the breast suppression map with all its features, while if you take the visual cortex as a seed, it's only correlated with itself. In, in rats, both areas give you the breast suppression map because both of them are engaged. So what we can say is that in primates, human and non-human, we seem to have kind of an uncoupling of the V1 or visual cortex from the rest of the brain during breast suppression, while in rats, this is not the case. So at this point, I guess you're wondering, okay, this is interesting, but first of all, where do we go from here? And most importantly, I guess you're asking yourself as I am, but what does it all mean? <laughs> and uh, I don't have a good satisfying answer for you. However, in the, in the few minutes that's left of my talk, I will tell you, first of all, what we are working uh, on currently to, to move fur further with this project. And I will also go into some speculation about what, uh, what could be the source of the result, uh, but take it with a grain of salt, because as I said, it's just a speculation at this point. So regarding uh, our, our next steps, we really want to know what is happening in the visual cortex of primates during breast suppression, because so what are the possibilities? So I think there are three scenarios, three scenarios. One is that the visual cortex is in continuous slow wave mode without suppressions. The second possibility is that it's a constant suppression without any bursts. So the first possibility here represents the, the previous stage of anesthesia, the lighter anesthesia. And the second possibility represents the, the deeper or the next level of anesthesia, the isoelectric state. But there's another possibility, uh, which is that it may be is doing breast suppression like everybody else or every other area. However, for some reason, we could have a local uh, uncoupling of the neurovascular system. Uh, I cannot imagine how this would be the case, but if you only have fMRI and you have nothing else, uh, you cannot exclude this fact because fMRI, as I said, measures blood oxygenation and not activity. To really untangle uh, which of these three scenarios is true, what you need to do is you need to get closer to the source. You need to get closer to neural activity. So you either need electrophysiology or calcium imaging to get a more direct measure of neural activity. And what we are doing currently is we are doing uh, two photon calcium imaging in the visual cortex of rats uh, to get to establish that we indeed have breast suppression there. And in the future, we want to do that in marmosets to see why the marmoset visual cortex is not doing breast suppression and what it is doing. However, this product is at the preliminary stage, so I, I haven't included any results from that yet. Um, the other uh, avenue to explore has to do with the origin of bursts. Because there's an interesting uh, series of studies, mainly rodents, which shows the, the following interesting phenomenon. If you have an animal, a rodent, in birth suppression, a mouse or a rat, and during birth suppression you stimulate the animal uh, with a sensory stimulus, let's say a flash of light or a loud sound, or you touch the animal, the stimulus sometimes will start a response which spreads very rapidly across uh, the cortex as a propagating wave. And if you look at the electrophysiology of that wave, it looks exactly like uh, spontaneous bursts look like. So if you saw that, you wouldn't differentiate from a spontaneously occurring burst. This made some people speculate that maybe what we observe in birth suppression is simply the reaction of the brain to incoming stimuli. So you kind of have this super critical state of the brain where every stimulus that comes in starts a, a chain reaction which spreads very rapidly all over the cortex. And uh, by the way, this, uh, these waves start in the cortex that receives the stimulus. So if you have a visual stimulus, it will start in the visual cortex as you would expect. Now, this whole theory about stimulus evoked bursts is quite congruent with what we find in rodents, because then, of course, if you look at the correlation, uh, you would get a pancortical map. I have to say that the spread of this wave is too fast for fMRI to capture, because it happens uh, within 100 milliseconds from the back of the rat to the front of the rat brain here. 
So we would have no, no hope of resolving the propagation with fMRI. So what we would see then would be a pancortical map. However, it does raise a question. Uh, if stimuli or external or internal stimuli are indeed the cause for bursts, why are sensory cortices excluded in primates? Because if bursts start there, you would expect the visual cortex or the somatosensory cortex to be a very frequent origin of bursts. What we see here is the opposite. So this is kind of perplexing. Uh, and uh, to resolve this uh, paradox or apparent paradox, uh, what, what we need to do is also to record fMRI during stimulation. So we basically repeat the same experiments, but stimulate the animal with light or with some sensory stimuli, of a, even if even with optogenetics, if you are feeling fancy, to see if you can trigger the occurrence of bursts, and if these trigger bursts would follow the same map as we observe here. Uh, now coming to the specul speculative part, I want to talk about uh, a model of burst suppression that was published in 2011 uh, in PNAS. And uh, the authors of that study uh, made an interesting thought. So they said, if you look at all the conditions that cause burst suppression, like hypoxia, deep hypothermia, and anesthesia, what do all these three conditions have in common? The common part is that they are all associated with very low metabolic rates. So the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen in the brain is very low. So what they did was they constructed a model where they had uh, they modeled cortical neurons excited or inhibitory in ensembles. And when they tweaked the metabolic rate, so when they adjusted the production rate of ATP to low, they saw that this kind of burst suppression-like behavior appeared. So you would get these bursts alternating with suppressions. And the lower the metabolic rate, the longer the suppressions, like we also see in, 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 in patients and in, in, hum in actual data. And the theory is that when you have a very low metabolic rate, during a burst, during activity, you exhaust some kind of resource, which is not yet identified, and you no longer can sustain activity, so you fall into suppression. And during the suppression, this resource, which was exhausted, starts recovering. And when it recovers above a critical point, you enter the next burst of activity until you exhaust it again and you cycle through again and again and again. So this is quite a, a, an interesting explanation. And uh, what does it mean for our results? I thought that the, the visual areas in primates are very highly specialized. So they have many peculiarities, which make them different from other areas, like in cell types, in the cortical content of myelin, and so on. So maybe these areas impose some special metabolic demands uh, or have special metabolic rates during anesthesia, which would uh, make them not be in the same state as the rest of the brain. While in rats, we could imagine that the metabolic profile is more uniform across the cortex, and then the whole cortex enters breast suppression at the same time. However, as I said, this is just speculation. However, uh, in our data, we have something that's kind of in support of this hypothesis, because uh, we have multiple species. And as you know, species have very different metabolic rates. So if you look now at the the time course or the time scale of breast suppression activity across species, which I've plotted here for all four species that I studied, you see that in humans, this alternation of bursts and suppressions happens very, very slowly. So each individual burst or suppression may last minutes, multiple minutes. In macaques and marmosets, uh, these tend to be quite shorter, the bursts, while in rats, they are even shorter with the bursts being very brief for a few seconds. And this is also reflected if you look at the power spectra uh, of these time courses. So maybe uh, metabolism is also a reason there. Maybe the faster metabolic of rats uh, causes also this phenomenon to happen at a faster time scale. But to, to really go into this, we would have to do some further modeling to see uh, if, uh, if this time scale matches with the predictions of the model. So that's all I want to talk about. Uh, if uh, I would like to thank um, my lab, mem uh, in the members of my lab. So I work in the functional imaging lab and uh, under the supervision of 
Professor Suzanne Boretius, and uh, she has been very supportive throughout uh, my PhD and now, um, and also every other member of the lab who helped me in one way or another uh, during this project. Uh, I would also like to thank my collaborators uh, from Munich uh, and also from Finland who provided me with, uh, with data and with advice. Uh, and thank you all for your attention. If you wish to know more about the, the study, you can read um, the preprint that's on a bioarchive, or you can contact me anytime via email, uh, Twitter, or Mattermost. So I guess now the floor is open for questions. Um, so we already had a first question by Gabriel Desrosiers Grégoire. I don't know if you want to ask it yourself or um, otherwise. Well, okay. I'll just read it out. Or no. Mm -hmm. I can. Uh, I can say it. Uh, I guess it was. It wasn't clear to me how you um, define your threshold and the correlation medians, median values in animals versus humans, since uh, you don't have the EEG data anymore. Yeah, that's a, a great point. Uh, thank you very much for the question. That's actually the main weakness um, of this approach. So I, I will show you. Uh, so the threshold question um, is an interesting one because, of course, uh, the threshold here uh, in my approach has to be arbitrary because uh, we kind of have a, a two states, um, the continuous state and the breast suppression. But in real life, the transition between them happens gradually. So the, uh, and also the, the metric we, I'm using, the medial of correlation is also a continuous measure. So I have to make a cutoff to say, okay, this is breast suppression or not. And um, the cutoff cannot be the same for every data set because it depends of, of course, on how big part of the brain is, in, is correlated with breast suppression, also the quality of your data, the SNR, and so on. And I wouldn't expect it to be the same across species. So it's um, the, the main weakness is that the threshold has to be arbitrarily defined. In animals, uh, because I don't have the EEG and the threshold is arbitrary, uh, I have no direct proof that what I'm choosing is actually breast suppression. However, the, the components I chose in animals were the ones that were the most striking examples. So there were some ambiguous cases where I, I didn't take into account. So I only, I only considered the most uh, striking cases of uh, breast suppression. Uh, show an example. So here uh, is the macaque example where I've highlighted the, the runs I've chosen in green, and I kind of chose those that have one component with asymmetric correlation and all the others close to zero. But this doesn't work in all cases. Uh, you could imagine many scenario where this would be problematic. So if we really want to build a EEG free classifier uh, of this uh, phenomenon, we probably should take a, a different approach. Uh, however, as I said, the, the fact that in rats we find all components at 2% where we would expect them with this method is, is quite encouraging. Okay, thank you. Um, we also have a question by Cindy. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering about the uh, low metabolic rate hypothesis how that one would fit with, for example, the visual cortex that is not showing um, like um, the correlation, like the other cortex areas. Yeah, thank you, Cindy. Uh, well, how it fits depends on what the visual cortex is doing, which we, as I said, we do not know yet. So um, there are several possibilities here. Uh, just a moment. So I, say, I said, I think there are uh, three scenarios so for what's happening in the visual cortex. And uh, I think the third one is not very likely. So one of the first two is happening. So if, for example, we, uh, we find in our two photon experiments that the visual cortex is in continuous slow wave mode and is not doing any suppressions, this would mean that the visual cortex is somehow more resilient to this metabolic defect. So it's able to sustain activity 
while the other areas are stopping activity. While if you find that it's in constant suppression, it would mean the opposite. It would mean that uh, the visual cortex is very sensitive to metabolic demands, so it stops all activity uh, while the other areas are still going. And actually, I don't have a good intuition of which which one of these two uh, would be true. So, uh, but both of these scenarios would show anti-correlation because this bursts and suppression um, transitions are so robust and so large, as you saw in the carpet plots, that they become the dominant driver of correlation. And if an area is not jumping between the two, if it's staying in one or the other all the time, it basically does not correlate uh, with the jumps. Uh, but what, how exactly it fits in the metabolic hypothesis depends on uh, which of these two scenarios is actually true. But my intuition, uh, although I said it's uh, it's a more or less a coin toss, if I would have bet money, I would bet on the on the first scenario, on the continuous slow wave activity. Thank you. And we also have a question from Jeremy. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the very clear and interesting talk. Um, so yeah, my question was. Um, Considering that one of the goals of uh, quite a few people that do uh, animal fMRI is to get to a state as close as possible to the awake state, um, how do the, um, the con continuous slow waves and the constant suppression, or not, not the constant suppression, but the, the burst suppression uh, network in the brain, like um, so spatial network, how do they compare to um, the, the default mode network. Hmm. Um, yeah, so regarding the, your comment, it's very interesting because uh, my background is also, uh, I came, I first came to the study from an animal fMRI perspective. And the studies I did in the past was actually to optimize anesthesia in rats in ways that would give me the most awake-like state, uh, which he mentioned is the goal of most people in, 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 in this field. Um, but in terms of uh, networks, so in what uh, has happened in many studies in animals, uh, especially in rats, is that people uh, often find uh, a network when they do resting state analysis, they find a network which unifies the entire cortex. And they say, okay, it's uh, uh, high hyperconnectivity. Or sometimes they regress this out completely by doing global signal regression. Uh, but this is actually burst suppression, what they are regressing out. So what they are looking at often, although they want to, to study resting state connectivity, is basically the, is the result of this burst suppression. Now, if you want to avoid that, which, but people are we're aware of this. So people doing uh, fMRI in rats are aware of this weird phenomenon. And what they do to avoid it is either um, they use some anesthetic that does not cause burst suppression. A very popular one is uh, dexmedetomidine, which I've also used in the past. Uh, or they use very low uh, constraints of isoprene, which puts you in the in the slow wave state. And metomidin, by the way, also uh, gives the slow waves. So in that slow wave state, uh, the connectivity seems to be more awake-like, but reduced. So if you take, um, let's say, a seed in any brain area, the connectivity in that state would be somewhat uh, limited compared to the awake state. Regarding default mode network specifically, uh, I haven't um, so I haven't analyzed this data in, in the seven or seventeen networks, but just from looking at it, it looks like a default mode network um, is always uh, part of it because, as I said, the cingulate uh, has uh, much correlation in it. Also, parietal areas here, the temporal areas. So, as uh, I would expect that. Default mode network would be um, always correlated with it. Perhaps it's interesting to think of default mode uh, of uh, this burst suppression network as a kind of expanded default mode. Uh, but this is easy to do in humans. This analysis that you're proposing, because in humans we can directly look at how this varies across networks. In animals, uh, in some animals, uh, I guess we have published default mode networks or what we call default mode networks. So we could also do this in macaques, perhaps, uh, and in rats. But I, I just haven't done this um, 
this analysis. But uh, from the way the maps look like, it looks like the higher order areas and default mode network sits at the most uh, far end on this gradient from unimodal to multimodal uh, are pretty much involved. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, perfectly. Yeah, that's a uh, very interesting. Thank you. And this expandable idea is what I, I found it looked like. Uh, so yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, we'll take one last question and then stop recording and anybody interested and in who has additional questions can just stay on for a bit longer. Um, so we have a question by MD Taufik Nassif. I thank you very much for the very nice presentation. Uh, I have basically two questions. Uh, one question is, do you think that hemodynamic response function in humans, uh, primates or rodents are same or similar, or there is a variability? And another question is, um, um, did you apply any sort of like uh, ventral signal regression in your fMRI data pre-processing? Because uh, we always uh, get questions that um, this hemodynamic, uh, I mean, um, like the CSF signal removal might also remove the effect. So um, I was wondering to hear, have your available comment regarding that. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, thanks for the question. So your first question was about HRFs across species, and that's actually a very interesting uh, uh, kind of field, which uh, uh, I, I find very fascinating, but the, the, the answer is no. So. HRFs differ between species. Uh, so if you, and what I found in the past, and also there are some published uh, hemodynamic response functions in rats, is that it tends to be faster. So in rats, for example, the time to peak seems to be around three seconds and not around six to eight seconds, like the, the case for humans. The overall shape is similar, but of course this also depends on the anesthesia you're using or if you're recording awake and so on. And I will show you something. Uh, so the HRF not only varies with species, but it also varies with the anesthesia. And I will show you some examples here. Uh, regarding the species difference, yes. So just because the HRF is faster in, in rats, you would expect uh, this alone to have a, to lead to a kind of faster, um, faster looking time scale of birth suppression. But the the differences in time scale are so huge that they are not simply explainable by a faster HRF uh, in rats. Regarding anesthesia, just a moment, I have a slide for that. Yes. So when I compared uh, the EG derived model to the asymmetric principal component, I basically did a cross-correlation analysis to, to see if there's any time lag. And the, the EG-derived model was made using the canonical HRF, so the canonical human awake HRF 2 gamma. Uh, when I did this cross-correlation analysis, I noticed that the, the asymmetric principal component was lagging a few seconds behind the model I derived from the EEG. So the time lag was around four to six seconds for most cases. And actually, if you correct it for this, so if you shifted uh, the principal component to account for the time lag, uh, then you got a near perfect correlation between the two. So the, the, the only imperfection in the correlation was due to this time lag. And what this tells you is that the actual hemodynamic response uh, is slower than the canonical HRF predicts, which is uh, actually to be expected. It's a known fact that anesthesia as a rule slows down the HRF. So the time to pick will be longer uh, under anesthesia than under awake conditions. So yeah, it depends both on the anesthesia and on the species, but we don't have good uh, models and data for all of this. So I would love to have a package that gives you an HRF for each species and the anesthesia, but this is not yet uh, available. Uh, regarding the, the regression of the CSF, no, I didn't regress it. And there are two reasons uh, for that. One is that uh, in humans, you can do it because ventricles are huge. But if you're trying to uh, define an ROI in a rat with a ventricle or in a marmoset, you will run into trouble. So you, you always run into partial, vo partial volume effects because these uh, uh, ventricles are quite thin. So if you try to define an ROI within the ventricle, it will always contain signal from actual brain. 
and the other so and because I want to do the analysis in a comparable way across species, I kind of use the more or less the same preprocessing steps in all data sets. I, I decided not to do that. And the other reason is that because this breast suppression activity is so global, if you do some regressions like that, like CSF regressions or global signal regression, you also take away some of that signal. And um, you can also see in the in the slide I showed about the, the ventricles. Uh, just a moment. Here. Um, but the ventricles do not have a nuisance signal. So the signal is not nuisance. It's actually a direct real effect of the breast suppression. So it's an exact anti-correlation of what happens in the EEG. And it is caused by this movement, which I described. So in general, my intuition is to be very skeptical of these regression techniques and to really know what I'm doing when I regress something out, because sometimes you regress something out that it's a real phenomenon. Uh, and people also did it with breast suppression in the past. If you do global signal regression on such a data set, because the signal is more or less global, you're basically left with nothing. So yeah, that's my take on that. Yeah, thank you very much for the explanation. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for this absolutely fantastic talk. Uh,